Welcome to the March Teleadvisors webinar. Uh, today the topic is Raising Able, Scaling Learning Design with a Design System. The presenter is Joyce Seitzinger for RMIT Online. My name is Wendy Tallio and I'm your host today. We've also got Colin uh, Simpson who's probably going to monitor the chat and uh, I'm going to introduce Joyce and then I'll hand over to her. So Joyce is a learning designer director at RMIT, RMIT Online, the online education arm of RMIT University. She's an advocate for learning experience design at scale as a tool for driving digital transformation in education. With more than 20 years experience in designing blended and online learning experiences, She's been part of the online education industry as it has matured. She's seen what works, what doesn't, and the same mistakes made over and over again when learning design doesn't happen in a multidisciplinary team that combines subject matter experts with digital pedagogy, design and production expertise. So thanks very much, Joyce, for running this webinar. Over to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome and to be honest at the beginning of this week I was thinking of reaching out to Wendy and Colin and checking whether this was still the right session to run because I can imagine that we've all been in a really strange world for the last two weeks um, and that people might want to focus more on some practical tips and tricks for um, for how to um, you know manage their day-to-day -day work now that our work lives have been completely overhauled. Um, however, um, one of the things that's actually allowed myself and the team to make this shift relatively easily is the fact that we had already built a design system. And it's been very interesting, the dichotomy in our household. So for those of you who don't know, my partner is Mark Smithers and he works at RMIT University proper. And our work lives, obviously we're both now working in the same in the same household, but the things that we work on are very different. I am still able to continue working on the typical projects that I was working as we've been able to shift online quite seamlessly, whereas his day is now consisting of using, uh, uh, consists of basically supporting academic staff. And I'm sure that that's the same for everyone else. Um, and uh, and what I realized and what we realized as we were talking about this, it's all very fascinating, is that while he, while some members of his team should definitely be doing that day to day support, some other people need to cordon off time or be cordoned off altogether in order to start building out for like the next phase and start putting together what their design system is going to be. So uh, from taken from that perspective, I think this session can still be uh, really helpful, uh, but I'm also really willing to like just chat about other things and make sure that we've got enough time to just be exchanging some practice. Um, so with that, I am going to do, we've got, there's about 30 of us. And I'm going to do a quick, what we like to call in our team, a circle of love. And basically the idea is, um, uh, what I'd like you to do is to just let me know what your energy levels are today from a, on a scale from one to 10 and add it uh, uh, one word that describes how you're feeling. A three, a two, we've got some sixes, someone's got their birthday, that's awesome, mostly spent, nine, good. I have to say for the people who are scoring lower than seven, um, you know, thank you for showing up today because it shows that, you know, you're still interested in, uh, in reaching out and connecting to people, which sometimes can be really, really hard. That's great. Thanks, everyone. Um, for me, it's definitely an eight, um, and what I'm feeling is uh, really creative. Like I'm tired as well, but I'm also finding that 
people are just like problem solving people are thinking up of different ways to do things and it's just like that is giving me a lot of energy as well so while i'm sure we can't continue this frenetic pace um at the moment like i'm getting a lot of energy from this idea of problem solving and and, and being able to be a bit more creative with some of the work that we do so um and um and as you go forward and work with your own teams, this can be a really good exercise to do um, because while some people in your team might be feeling really up and positive, other people in your team might not be feeling that way. And it's just good to get an indication of that because it might change how you actually present things back to people or maybe how quickly you might expect to get something back from people. All right, so with that, let me get started in this uh, into what I'm going to be sharing with you today. So I'm going to be talking about our uh, learning design system and also how it's helped us to actually scale learning design. And I wanted to start with sharing a little bit about why myself and the team need to scale learning design. So for those of you who are not familiar with RMIT Online and what we do, we are basically like, we're part of the university, um, but we are like the online education arm of the university. All of our courses and programs are fully online. Um, uh, we work closely together with our academic colleagues in order to develop those courses and programs, but not all of our uh, programs and courses that we offer are award-bearing. So um, we've got a whole bunch of degrees and those are the things that you see on the left hand side. Those are future degrees. Those are all like grad certs and grad dips and um, degrees, full degrees. And then we've also got um, this other portfolio of short courses, which are really more about professional development. Um, and um, they cover um, topics that are very much future of work focused. Um, and uh, you've probably seen our developing blockchain strategy courses, which has been one of our most popular ones, and uh, some of the some of the other really interesting areas that we work in, like cybersecurity and also uh, developing AI strategies. Um, so that just gives you an idea about just like what the breadth is of the types of courses and portfolios that we uh, do learning design for. And to give you an idea about how we have achieved this, because RMIT Online has only been around for about three years. We started at the end of 2016. Um, and the way that we've been able to grow quite fast is because we don't try to do everything in-house. We work together with uh, both our university partners, and it's really nice to see some people here in the room. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> Um, that, um, that, that we work really, really closely with. Um, but we also work with um, external partners who help us to develop these courses. So uh, when you look at this, you can see that we've basically had four distinct portfolios. One is our accelerated postgraduate, which means uh, that students do things uh, or do an entire semester's worth of work in about six weeks. We have our non-accelerated undergraduate and postgraduate. Um, we have our future degrees, which is a new type of portfolio that we rolled out last year. We basically run four teaching terms each year. Um, and then we have our future skills, which are the professional development courses that I was talking about. And as you can see, we work with different partners for different parts of the value chain. So whereas with Accelerated Postgraduate, we have the same partner for student acquisition and course build. We then have a second partner that actually help us do the teaching and delivery. And then we've got various different things um that we do for each of the portfolios and different choices that we've made um, it's allowed us to grow really quickly and to roll out new programs really quickly um, but it also means that we've had to develop real expertise in doing the management around those partners oh that doesn't look good oh. sorry guys um obviously collaborate doesn't like some of my formatting let's hope that doesn't continue to be a theme. Um, be a theme with collaborate, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, fingers crossed. <laughs> if it doesn't work, I might just switch over to sharing my screen. Is that possible, uh, Wendy? Sure, you can do that, yeah. yeah. All right, I won't do it for now, but if it continues to be like this, then I will. Um, but basically the idea, uh, the thing that I had in this slide that I wanted to share with everyone is the fact that all of these um, different portfolios also have like their own, um, and I'll just forward to the next slide so we're not 
getting cognitive overload. Um, but basically the idea is that every single one of those portfolios has got its own style and of like how it is delivered. So the accelerated postgrad, for instance, has six teaching periods a year. The new in-house portfolio that we run has four teaching periods a year. Um, the, um, the short courses actually start twice a month. So in terms of how many different partners we have, how many different teachers we need to onboard, how many mentors we need to onboard, um, we've got about 31 go lives. So we are always either going live or about to go live. So in order to do that, we really depend on working closely with our partners. Now that's been great for the last two and a half years. This year, we are actually looking to deliver 150% uh, of what we did last year. So we really needed to scale up even more. So this year, what's happening is that in terms of our build partners, and we have we make a distinction between build partners that we work with, that's like other learning design companies, and discipline partners. And discipline partners can be both our industry partners, our academic partners at the university, and sometimes other uh, expertise partners that we have. So um, we started and current the current state has been or at least at the end of 2019 was we had three build partners, four different types of portfolios and about 50 discipline partners if you think about them in terms of different organizations with we, that we work with and also different schools and uh, program teams that we work with at the university. Um, this year, in order to meet like the uh, the increased uh, roadmap that we've set out, um, we are looking to scale up to eight build partners. Um, we are also looking to add a new type of portfolio as we start to increase um, um, our B two B type of offerings. And as a result, we are also looking to onboard more discipline partners. So you can see that our ecosystem is not getting any simpler. It's just going to uh, increase growing and it's just going to start um, getting um, more complex. And so the problem with that for us is that um, we need to make sure that the learning design quality of every single one of those courses that we build with all of those different partners involved is always of at the level that we want um, that we want to offer our students, and the, as we know, most of the people here have done some learning design. Some of you might be more on the education technology side now, but almost everyone in this room will have done some learning design at some point. And the fact is that um, actually, before I go into that, if everyone can just pop into the room, what their original degree was in. And I will put mine in. Um. <laughs> awesome. Film and theater studies, English lit and Russian studies. Okay, that's almost as exotic as mine. Masters of Ed leadership. Um, this actually exemplifies what the issue is in learning design, which is that most of us have come from really varying backgrounds enrolled into learning design or education technology roles. And whereas um, some other disciplines, like for instance, programmers or engineers, we have, re have really strong principles and ways of working within learning design. We are still maturing as a discipline and we haven't quite got those things yet. And so if you ask one person to build a chair or design a chair, basically design a course, they're going to come up with a very different way of doing that than other people. And so if we are trying to provide a consistent experience for our students, we need to provide some kind of guidance about how, what that experience is and make sure that across that entire complex ecosystem of learning design partners, multimedia developers, uh, industry partners and academic partners, that we have a shared language for working with each other, uh, a one that actually um, ties us all together, gives us an idea about how we are going to, um, to work together effectively and to a certain standard. I do love the diversity that I'm seeing in here. I type mine in uh, just at the top, but mine's a bachelor's in Celtic studies, um, which I think gets topped by Anthony's English Lit and Russian studies. <laughs> 
So, um, and so that's really where the idea came from, from uh, for us to start building our design system so that we can work effectively with these um, eight, um, uh, eight different learning design partners and 80 different um, discipline partners. If so, one of the things that I've noticed over the last two weeks, um, there's been a bit of noise about this on Twitter and I think also in Campus Mail, I'm not sure, um, uh, but basically um, that with this pivot to online, by the way, if you're looking to it you, you, on Twitter, people are either using the hashtag pivot online or pivot to online to denote the big shift that all the universities are having to make in moving to teaching online. And one of the things that I've noticed is that people are really struggling uh, or that some managers in higher ed are really struggling with how do they manage a remote workforce. Um, and one of the tips that I wanted to share with everyone, if you find yourself either managing a team or being managed by someone who is now jumping to um, like a, um, uh, a way of trying to control people's work is to start looking at some of the resources from Management 3.0. As I've moved into more um, into this leadership position within RMIT Online, I found it really helpful to both uh, read the Management 3.0 book, which is a great book, um, but they also do regular uh, podcasts. They also do regular uh, workshops. They've got little cards and games. Um, and, and the big thing that they are all about is that when you are a leader in this kind of new workspace in a place that is all about digital transformation, you can't manage the people. You have to manage the system and that's very much what we're doing with uh, the way that we're working both with our ecosystem partners and also with the, what we've set up when in our uh, able learning design system which I'll be talking you through uh, so I just want I added this uh, at the last minute this morning as this discussion has been raging around Twitter and raging you know in our professional conversations I thought this is actually something that has helped me to do the thing that that I'm going to present to you next and I just wanted to put it out there because they are a great resource. Um, cool. So um, so there's been long there's long been calls for us to formalize how we design for learning. Peter Goodyear has written a lot about this and I know a lot of you have been students of his, Diane Lorillard as well and Eileen Scanlon all really aiming for people to start really thinking about how do we design for education uh, and that we need to get more formal about how we do that and have like shared professional practices around that. And one of the things that I started to look at is look at how other disciplines manage this. And when you look at um, uh, disciplines like UX, like CX, um, like uh, web development, what they do is they start looking at a design system. And there's tremendous, again, there are enormously valuable resources out there. Uh, this is one of the better ones. It's share, it was created by uh, the people who run Envision. Uh, it's an open handbook on what design systems are. And I think one of the things that probably speaks to us is this uh, top paragraph here, which is that design is struggling to scale with the applications it supports because design is often still bespoke. And I think that's where we sit with learning design. And also, like, as I'm hearing the the conversations that my partner is having with the staff that he's supporting it is still very much like listening to the problem and then coming up with a solution that is customized and bespoke for that person rather than you know trying to develop something that is for the entire system and that's you know what I was mentioning earlier around like if you're starting if you and your team are currently caught in this trap of um, just responding some of you need to cordon off you know, either from the team to start looking at, well, what are the more uh, long lasting resources that we need to build? What are the issues, what are the parts of the system that we need to be putting in place for four weeks from now, two months from now? You know, what is this going to look like by the end of the year? And how will we know that we're being successful? Because if you're gonna be stuck in this like one-to-one -one support and design function, you're gonna be stuck there until the end of the year and no one can last that long. 
Um, so uh, if you're if you're looking for a bit of a weekend read or um, thinking like, okay, this this sounds like something I might want to get stuck on, this is a great free resource uh, to get stuck into, and it takes you through the through like some of the basic principles. And um, some of the things that are in there are very are you'll find uh, are very often uh, focused on web development, and so that you will have to do some translation to the education work that we do, and that's something that myself and the team are working on all the time. Um, so who do design systems serve? Basically the design systems should be serving our teams as users. So the idea is that if you have the design system then you can stop talking about what the work is and you can start actually focusing on the problems. And so when we think about our design system and who it serves it's basically um, our internal learning designers it is people like Cheryl, who's in the room here with us, um, to give her an idea about like what are the quality standards that we're setting. At, she is our liaison person into the colleges at the university, so she can be communicating with staff about you know what are some of the expectations, what are the processes that are that that you can expect when you start working with RMIT online. Um, the other people that our design system serves are our learning design partners and the learning designers in those teams, the multimedia designers in those teams, the videographers in those teams. Um, so you really have to think about it as the people that help you build your products. Those are the users of your design system. Um, some really great examples of design systems. Again, most of these are open. Thanks, Wendy, for scribing along uh, in the in the chat window. Uh, so this is Atlassian, and um, uh, <laughs> some of you might be coming very familiar with the Atlassian suite of products at the moment. Uh, they run um, they run um, both uh, Confluence, which is a um, like a uh, a wiki for your organization, basically, um, a knowledge sharing platform. Uh, they also run JIRA, which is a ticketing system, um, and we uh, are, you know, we, we conduct lots of our work through both JIRA and also Trello in order to help us manage all the work that we do. But they've been very open um, about their design system, and you can go and have a look at how they've set that up and maybe see which parts of that you can borrow or adapt for your own use. Um, another great um, design system, and again, super open, they write blogs about what they do, etc., is Airbnb, which I can uh, highly recommend as well. Um, and one of the ones that's probably a little bit closer to the type of work that we do is uh, the BBC. The BBC have had a global experience layer for many, many years. And again, you know, they develop this openly, they share it with everyone. But if you, the reason that I say that the BBC is probably a little bit closer to what we do is that they have a tremendous amount of television program and movie producers, production companies that they work with when they, um, you know, um, uh, when they work with those production com companies and commission a particular program, they want to make sure that they have like all the style guides and all of the other things that they need so that that program feels like it's a BBC program. And I think that is what we're aiming for as well, which is that, yes, we work with all these different learning design partners, but what we want our students to experience is that they feel like they're getting the RMIT online experience. So that's where I think that when we look at design systems, some of these design systems by other content production companies might be closer to what we do than, for instance, an Atlassian or, uh, or an Airbnb. Um, one of the... Um, one of the few, I think, educational companies that I know that are, have really embraced design systems at uh, at a global level is probably FutureLearn and uh, Ala Kolmatova, who uh, did the lead work on some of that, um, has actually written a book, and it's a great book. I highly recommend it called Design Systems. And what she says there is that without a shared design language and practices, collaboration is difficulty. Uh, and that's really where you, what you want to do is that you want to have a shared design language and practice. Um, for us, 
you know, with us, with our internal team, and then going outward like circle by circle, we want to have a shared design language and practices with our learning design partners, with our academic partners, and with our industry partners, so that we all understand what we, when we mean by an RMIT online course, and what we, that we all have a shared understanding of what we mean by great student experience. And so for us, our ABLE, uh, we, so we have uh, adopted a design system, and it's still nascent, uh, but growing quickly. Um, and we have called it ABLE. And ABLE stands for Activity-Based Learning Experiences. Um, which is that what we've done is we've looked at what the research tells us about great online learning design, uh, great online learning experiences. What is it that will actually make students successful? Uh, we looked in particular at the work that was being coming out of the Open University UK and also FutureLearn. A lot of it led by Dr. Mike Sharples. Um, and this idea that uh, what you really want to do is to uh, make sure that when students are engaging online in some type of distant education um, format, that you want to make sure that you give those students particular activities to engage with. Um, the, the research from the Open University UK was a re, there's a really interesting article that they did, um, and oh god, the name of the researcher just escapes me. But it's basically 150. They they did a, a uh, an overview of 157 uh, learning designs. Um, ah, thank you, Hans Tutanel and Rintis. <laughs> they did a uh, an overview of uh, the learning design in 157 of their courses, and found that about 60% um, of all activities were assimilative. And what they also found was that um, uh, students would prefer courses that were really high in like. Um, uh, assimilative tasks, so things like readings and things like, thanks for that, Carmen, uh, things like reading and things like watching videos, and that's what students really want, but they also showed that when that is what the students get, the student results and the student outcomes are actually lower. And um, when we engage students in active learning, their performance goes up, um, but there is a paradox, which is that quite often the students don't like the course as much. Um, so that's probably another battle to be fought within our institutions about how much um, student satisfaction should really count, but I won't get into that right now. But that was one of the drivers for us to say, okay, we are going to be all about learning activities and making sure that we actually help students to be successful in those online courses. So for us, each course has to have a is basically a sequence of learning activities. All of those learning activities are constructively aligned to the assessments. Each learning activity is actually a combination of a few smaller learning tasks, and one of those tasks should give the students an indication of how they're actually going and performing in that activity. Um, we've also set up a set of learning design principles that underlie those, and you can look at these and maybe take a screenshot or whatever, but there is no magic here, people. Um, these are things that you are all doing. These are things that we all know to be true. But again, it comes back to that shared language and the shared understanding. So by codifying it in this way and actually setting it up as these are our learning design principles, it starts to help us give those uh, th that shared language. So this would be something that um, under each of these uh, principles, we actually have a set of elements. And when we do a learning design audit of a course, that is what we are scoring. And that is what we are feeding back to our learning design partners. So by organizing it this way and actually just articulating it, it means that we then all have a shared language about, ah, uh, you know what, you're actually like in, you're not meeting learning design principle three. Um, you know, we've, we can go and talk to the library about finding some other learning resources, et cetera. So it just starts to help you actually measure and track how you work together and how well you're performing against the quality standards that we've set up. What gets measured gets done, says Hans. Absolutely, that's certainly what we are finding. So um, to give you an idea about how we set it up, basically we talk about our learning activities as pedagogical building blocks. Uh, they should have activity objectives. We have six different task types that we help people classify. 
Um, it's partly based on the work that was coming out of the Open University and also partly based on several other learning theories. Um, and activities are time boxed to fit into study pockets. So what we found with our fully online students is that they often are very strategic learners and they set up study times for themselves. And what we wanted to do is uh, time box the activities in such a way that students can do them in about an hour and a half to two and a half hours, never longer. Um, and the idea being that you could sit down and complete something within one session and then walk away from it knowing that you've been successful and so it would gain, give students this sense of progression through the course. And then what we've done, we've actually created different course recipes for each of those different four portfolios that we design for because sometimes a learning design partner will work with us on several different of those portfolios and um, and those recipes just help us all make sure that um, that those courses always come out with the same rhythm, with the same um, uh, level of activities, with the same constructive alignment. Um, and we had a little bit of a play uh, trying to come up with uh, something that was a bit similar to the Agile Manifesto uh, with the ABLE Manifesto. But basically what we try to do is we want to prioritize student experience over teacher experience. It's not saying teacher experience is not important, but when you work together with an academic colleague, they can often insist that they want the online version to closely mirror the on-campus version because that's easier for them. However, what they want to design is possibly not good for the 150 on fully online learning students uh, that you've got. And so uh, when it comes to that, you know, this is one of our guidelines, which is that we want student experience over teacher experience. We want learning activities over learning content and we want learning technology solutions over LMS functionality. So if the LMS can't do what we want to do in order to deliver this course really, really well, then we will look for other learning technology solutions. Um, so in terms of the types of things that we've built into our learning design system, uh, we have guidelines, uh, templates, processes, examples, and training. And uh, as I was reflecting on this, I thought, gosh, it's not that different. Most universities would have some type of teaching and learning repository um, with, um, uh, you know, that just highlights what good practice is and, um, and highlights how things should be done. And uh, as I was doing that, I, uh, I realized that the big difference between our design system um, is that our design system is a system in action. So this gets used all the time and we track its use and measure its use at all times. So we make sure that when our learning design partners um, do um, uh, build a course map for us, that that course map matches the course recipe. So there's always sign off points that make sure that it is actually being followed. And I think that's where um, I think some of the universities in this pivot to online now are really struggling because we haven't got the QA systems at scale to be able to do that. But if you know if you are working with your learning design team and thinking about how are we going to do this work and you know that 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 small cohort of people are going to look ahead at what you're going to want to do, you'll want to identify some quality points that you will start to measure so that you can see what effect you're having across the entire school, department, college, whatever it is that you're supporting. Um, and so the places where we actually do uh, some of that measurement is uh, we have a course map stage, uh, we have a prototype stage. We have a mid-course check-in that's halfway through the build project. Project we we check in with them, and then we also have a final QA. And so those are all the places where we go. All right, is this actually matching how we want this course to look? Um, and to me and the team, the way that we think about Able is that it basically exists in kind of three places. Uh, very much in the design phase and that's where we you know focus on like templates and guidelines for all of the learning designers and the academic staff that we work with it then also lives in how we build we've invested quite a lot in being able to build for able 
um, uh, by building like um, bespoke um, tools in Canvas that will allow us to drag and drop certain elements that we always want to see in our courses. Um, and that's been really, really powerful um, because again, this, having a shared language between ourselves and the tech team meant that they could see how they could make Canvas actually you know, uh, reflect the learning activities that we were building for. And then it lives in the third place, which is the measure area. Um, and so everyone on our learning design team has chosen one of these areas that they're going to champion and um, uh, and they do it for at least six months. And then after that, we kind of reflect and see whether people still want to work on design or whether they maybe want to make a switch to the build team. So how do we know that this is being effective? Um, well, since we've introduced the first few principles, which was kind of at the, at the start of uh, ABLE, it was about two years ago now, our course development time has gone from 28 weeks to 16. So it's been really great. Um, we, uh, we now have more reliable outcomes. Our internal learning experience design teams now spend 40% less on our course projects. And we've also had improved pass rates. And then we've rolled out a new uh, satisfaction score because we found that the overall satisfaction score from the university was not perhaps giving us an accurate picture because it often measures lots of things that we can't actually control um, with course design. And so instead, um, we've cordoned off a few survey questions that go particularly to how students are finding the course. How are you finding the materials? Um, you know, was it clearly laid out? Was it easy to navigate? And that's where we really see the jump from 2017 to 2018, which is kind of when we initially started um, uh, managing our portfolio through our learning design principle. You can see it starts to have an effect. I also expect that there's probably only X amount that we can actually get to. I expect it always to hover between the 70 and the 80 and not to really crack that 80 barrier. So in order to now maintain this design system, uh, we really want to work close uh, with our um, uh, with our learning design partners. The idea is that it's not like a one-way street. We actually want to work together with them and make sure that we are meeting their needs so that when things are not that that are not that clear for them, they can just ask us for like new features. So we've given it a, uh, a home. It's got a temporary home on Canvas. Um, our UX team are now working with us to, in the second half of this year, move it to somewhere that we'll, where it will be sitting on a separate website. We've set up feedback loops. Uh, we do like a monthly um, uh, announcement to all of our learning design partners to let them know what's changed, um, to also ask for feedback and what uh, new features they may want. Uh, for instance, if we have an assessment guide that needs updating or something is unclear in it, then uh, we can do that and then it goes out in the next month's feeds. And that helps us to also prioritize the needs across all of our learning design partners. Um, the other thing is we want to measure its effectiveness, obviously, and uh, we want to make sure that we provide onboarding and training. So to go along with this design system, we've also set up a training course uh, that is aimed at the learning design uh, partners because they also have like high turnover in their workforce, new learning designers, again, from various backgrounds, Russian lit, Celtic psychology, um, and, they, and you want to make sure, again, that they get inducted into that shared language as well. So that's really all I had to kind of share with you and that I thought might be useful as you start thinking about, well, how are we going to manage this at scale? Uh, probably something that everyone is always thinking about, uh, but that has all of a sudden become uh, much more pertinent. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions and, um, uh, and um, uh, or just facilitate the discussion with everyone who's here. Thanks very much, Joyce. That's been great. Uh, if anybody had an unanswered question in the chat, maybe they could uh, either repeat it or uh, turn on your microphone. That would be great. I know there's been uh, some answers already put in the chat. Cheryl, the work of Garrison and Vaughan on online community of practice. Um, da, da, da. <laughs> Thanks, Hank. Uh, oh, hi, Hank. You look like you might be from my hometown. 
There is a question from Carmen. What systems do you use to measure the process? Ah, oh, yes. A bunch of stuff. <laughs> yep. So, uh, good question, Carmen. Uh, in order to measure the process, so we have an operations team, and um, they help us to actually track whether our projects are on track. So they very much, um, so they very much um, uh, track whether a, a project is meeting its milestones and meeting its deadlines. And the 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 main tool that they do to use. To, that they use to do that is a tool called monday.com um, so if you haven't taken a look at it yet and you're at the moment looking for online tools to do that monday is really really great um, but obviously you could use you know other types of tracking um, uh, uh, other types of tracking or project management software um, but that's very much what we realized what we need to do is to actually split between tracking whether a project is on time and that's very much what the operations team do. And then whether the, the, the uh, project is actually on quality target, and that's very much what the learning experience design team do. And so at those various stage gates that I was telling you about, um, we are currently in, uh, in the, so we already do a review and we feed that back, but we want to make that more explicit. Um, and so we actually want to start issuing like a quality score at each of those stage gates that we can then feed back to the partner and that way we also start to see whether some partners are maybe you know more more consistently submitting storyboards that meet our quality standards than other partners um, so that's something that's still in development we do have some measures already in place obviously the course design satisfaction score problem with that of course is depending on student feedback so that's very much a lag indicator what we're hoping with these other quality scores is that they could be like lead indicators so actually letting us know that this course might not quite be on target Some staff are not very social and face-to-face. -face. How do you work with such staff to be social online? Julian, what a pertinent question. <laughs> um, so, look, we we tend to run, at the beginning of a, course, of a new course uh, development, we tend to run three face-to-face, um, -face, three-hour workshops. We always thought we could run them online, but our academic staff insisted that that would never work. And therefore, we did them face to face last week. Obviously, that the whole world changed, and um, and we very quickly we skipped one workshop. Uh, and um, myself and the team worked together in order to see how we could be delivering it fully online. And what I found is that it actually worked better. Um, there was uh, there was much more collaboration. People had a real focus. So what we did is we created several artifacts that actually help us like to uh, surface the information that we look for in those workshops. And so the course recipe is one of them. Um, like we have some assessment templates that people need to fill out, etc. And by having them all there in the Zoom session together and focused on filling out those templates, it was actually a much more focused activity. Um, so it was really interesting. I actually found it uh, found it really interesting. I think so. I think there are some real aha moments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there could be a follow-on question. Earlier on, Kath asked, how do you get around the academic freedom, quote, unquote, and don't tell me what to do response <laughs> we get in my organisation from some academic staff when trying to get consistency in the student experience? Yes, um, that is certainly an issue. We are very lucky that um, we have a lot of buy-in from senior management. Um, and so um, we have the full backing of uh, our vice chancellor, Martin Bean, uh, who's been a real champion for digital transformation across the university. And he sits on our board. Um, so, um, so quite often we will work with a head of school and a school and a program team that are ready to work with us. But I'm certainly not going to paint the picture that this is always easy. Um, I think usually if you can get buy-in from, um, the, from the head of school, 
um, that is absolutely, um, you know, that is the best situation you can find yourself in because they will do some of those hard conversations for you and they should, you know, they should be driving that change management. That is not for someone who is new and who doesn't have a pre-existing relationship with that particular course coordinator. Um, and, um, however, when it, uh, does get harder. I think what's really important, and and we've done this with our team, is to develop a kind of like a set of principles for like what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And again, us having these learning design principles helps us. So when we say we want to do authentic assessment, which is a you know a drive across the university, but those are the principles that we know we are allowed to escalate against. So if we run into that, you know. TikTok of people saying like, oh no, I'm going to hang on to my online exam or my face-to-face -face exam. We know, us in the learning experience design team know that because that is a principle, that is one that cannot be compromised. And therefore we are perfectly uh, um, uh, at rights to go and escalate that with our partnership team. So we have a dedicated partnership team who do all the relationship management with the schools. Uh, and if we can't get to it there, like we have an escalation framework to to have those discussions. Uh, be, and, and, and again, really powerful when you come at it from it's always about the student experience what we're trying to safeguard. This is not a, you know, this is not a turf war. It is really about we know and we can prove from our quality scores that this is needed for to provide a good student experience. So I think if that's always that student experience advocacy is always at the heart, then I think you're always going to be in a really strong position. There's just a couple of questions. Uh, you talked about the those guidelines and that might uh, answer some, uh, to some extent, Chris asked, do the online units have the same lecturers, educators, or do they change around? And and then Maria asked, how do you get these guidelines across to teaching staff? Mm. So the um, do the online units have the same teaching staff? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. But the role of the teaching staff in the online units is very different. Um, uh, the teaching staff at the university are um, only are uh, are there as course coordinator, and uh, we have online facilitators that support our students um, in, in the delivery of those courses. And the course coordinator basically touches base with them at the beginning. And then usually like before the first assessment and then at the end of the course. Um, so quite often they will have been involved in originally developing the course, but we've got some courses that are as old as three years now and, you know, have to have changed course coordinators several different times. What we do get a request for is people who want to leverage the online materials to go back into their classroom materials, which is, I think is a great development. Sorry, the second question was around getting the guidelines to the academics. Uh, we run a pre-development session with all of the academics. That was something that we've learned through um, uh, trial and error, uh, which is that we found that if we didn't run the pre-development session, sometimes academics would come into the first design workshop and um, raise issues that we couldn't um, that we couldn't immediately resolve as part of that design workshop and then it could really slow it down for everyone. So instead what we've done is we now run a pre-development session usually about two weeks or maybe a week before the actual first workshop and we'll discuss things like assessments, do you think that there's going to be issue, any issues with that, um, do you think that there's going to be any issues with anything about the course experience as you currently deliver it, um, just things like that just to highlight anything that we may need to solve behind the scenes so that when we then get to the first design workshop everyone's free to really engage with that and during that pre-development session that's also when we'll get people across our learning design principles um, the guidelines what the process is going to be and what they can expect great thank you very much uh, okay. so we, we might wrap up there if you've got further questions uh, for Joyce you can get in contact with her her contact details are, you can find them on the web and on Twitter yeah and and we're going to uh, just reserve the last 10 minutes for a general chat so a round of applause in the chat please for Joyce thank you so thanks, much thanks everyone and don't forget to get up as we all chat together yes stretch <laughs> I'm gonna get up <laughs> <laughs> and go out and see some sunshine when this webinar is finished that's the recommendation <laughs>
Thanks, everyone. Lovely comments. I really appreciate it.